Good morning. I welcome you to worship on this first Sunday in Lent. We have begun our journey with Jesus as a people who are marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit. We will be walking with Jesus to Jerusalem and as we go preparing our hearts and our lives to meet the crucified and risen Christ at Easter. In this season of Lent, we have uh, made some changes to our order for worship. So uh, in this season, we will not have um, joyous refrains of praise. And our sung liturgy is a bit more reflective. Uh, it will be familiar to anyone who um, remembers the Lutheran Book of Worship setting two. So the sung parts of our, our uh, liturgy are from that setting. And I also want to just call your attention to um, the announcement in the bulletin which explains comments on the banners and the pyramids that we have for this season of Lent. Uh, we have the theme of the tree of life shaping our worship and uh, Karen did a wonderful job of setting the, the mood and the tone for our Lenten worship with her prelude which is also our call to worship this morning, the tree of life and awesome mystery. We'll be talking a little bit more about that imagery in my sermon today. For the call to worship, uh, it is a new hymn. It is by Marty Haugen, who uh, sings, has, has uh, written many of our favorite hymns. And the choir will sing the first verse this week to introduce it to us, and we will join in singing the second verse. And we will be using this uh, imagery in this song throughout the season of Lent. So let us worship. We turn to God alone as we begin our worship with the order for confession and forgiveness. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. As one people of God, we gather beneath the tree of life to confess our sin, remember the gift of our baptism into Christ, and seek reconciliation with God and with one another. God of mercy, breathe, breathe your, your spirit, spirit into, into our lives and our world. In Enliven our, our bones, dry our tears, tears cleanse our, our sin, sin, illumine our days, revive our faith, faith inflame our hearts, embolden our witness, empower your service, gather us beneath your tree of life, forgive us, renew us, and empower us with freedom of life in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the good news we each long to hear. God's love overflows, God's forgiveness is sure, God's welcome is all-encompassing. Rooted in the waters of our baptism into Christ, we are set free from sin and empowered to live lives of faith, love, and service. Amen. Amen. 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us, and the devil and all the forces that defy you tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading comes from the second chapter of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. We will read responsibly from Psalm 32. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to know the Lord keeps no guilt, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Why I held my tongue, my bones withered away, because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night, my moisture dried up as the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me for the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall. 
shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me and with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in my ways you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like horse or mule, which has no understanding and must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Gospel according to Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have been noticing the trees in this season, finding a certain stark beauty, even majesty, about the way trees stand silhouetted against the sky in winter with their bare branches reaching towards the light. I've also noticed that because it's been so warm lately that buds are already starting to form on some trees, signs of spring, and a sign of that force for recreation and renewal that is woven into the fabric of the universe. The poet Mary Oliver loved to walk and to sit among the trees, and she frequently wrote about them. In one of her poems, she says, when I am among the trees, they give off such hints of gladness, I would almost say that they save me and daily. Her poem is a tribute to the blessings we find in creation, the blessings of trees, and maybe in a way, even a reminder that we depend on trees for breath even daily. It came to me also that Mary Oliver might have been writing about the hu human journey to salvation, which begins with a tree in the Garden of Eden and ends with a tree where salvation is accomplished. In between these trees, scripture tells us, the story is the story of God's people and what it means to be human in a world of daily temptations and choices. A story of humans in need because of a tree. Humans in need of help and hope. Today's first reading and its reference to a tree sets the arc for this human story. In the Genesis story, we hear that the Lord God put the man, <clears throat> Adam, and his wife, Eve, in a garden. This one who created Adam from the Adam, from earth, 
provides and cares for human needs. From the beginning, Genesis tells us, being human, the human story is shaped by a relationship with God, our creator. According to the Genesis story, Adam and Eve were put in the garden by God for a purpose. They are to till the garden and to keep it. So Adam and Eve are given responsibility and they are given the freedom to enjoy the blessings of the garden. But God also sets limits on the freedom Adam and Eve enjoy. They are created by God. They are blessed by God. But they are not equal with God. So God commanded them, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. In the garden, then, they are permitted everything they need for a full, rich life as God intended. And they are prohibited from a choice that leads to death. Well, it's a familiar story, this ancient tale of Adam and Eve, not only because we've heard it before, but because it is repeated over and over again in our daily lives and in the world around us. God created us and blessed us with the goodness of creation, trees even. God blessed us with the gifts of family and community and with the freedom to create and to choose. And we want more. We pursue our own interests, we listen to the wrong voices, we trust our own efforts and instincts more than we trust God. This is the world of Adam and Eve, not only once upon a time, but here and now. According to the story told in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve ran away and hid from God once their eyes were opened and they realized what they had done. They are overcome by fear once they recognize their disobedience. And they are filled with shame and terror once they see that there is no going back to the innocent goodness and grace they once knew in their relationship with God. In this drama of human life, disobedience leads to fear and separation from God. And separation from God means death. This has been the human story since the dawn of time. Our Lutheran baptismal liturgy interprets the Genesis story in this way. We are born children of a fallen humanity. Martin Luther would say that we are curved in on ourselves. I've talked about this graphic posture of being curved in on ourselves many times before. This posture that centers our own egos and desires and closes us off to God and to others. We see this very traditional understanding of sin in the Genesis story. Once Adam and Eve started listening to the voice of the tempter, once they started to doubt God's good intentions, once they realized that they could serve their own interests and desires, Adam and Eve curved in on themselves, and they trusted their own impulses and choices without reference to God or God's instructions. In our gospel text from Matthew for today, we have the same basic set of characters as in the Genesis story. We have a human figure, and he is faced with choices while he is tired and hungry from his time of fasting. And we have the tempter, the voice of reason, the helpful persuader, the caster of doubt. The devil only wants what's best for Jesus, for Adam and Eve and for us. So the devil says, if you are hungry, yes, eat. If you are the son of God, claim your power. If you want it, take it. If it feels good, it must be good. So do it. For Jesus, spending time in the wilderness, fasting and praying is the very first thing he does after his baptism. Down by the Jordan Riverside, Jesus was named the beloved son of God. 
And in our reading today, he has gone to the wilderness to figure out what that means. I am this beloved son of God, now what? Here's the interesting thing. Jesus lived out his identity and mission as the son of God by being fully, painfully human. The story of Jesus in the wilderness is most significantly a story about being human. Now, Christians sometimes talk about following Jesus or emulating Jesus in order to become more like God. And it is certainly true that Jesus gives us the fullest revelation we have of God. And if we want to know what God is like, we can look to Jesus, to his love and compassion and his mercy. But I would also argue that Jesus came to show us how to be human, how to be the beloved and beautiful humans God intended us to be. And so the point is, if we follow Jesus in faith and trust, if we conform our lives to his, we will be better at being human. God doesn't ask us or expect us to be perfect, but God does want us to be transformed and renewed in our humanness and daily by the grace and love of Jesus. In today's gospel, we see Jesus as oh so very human, hungry and tired and being tested as we all are. And in contrast to Adam and Eve, Jesus does not heed the voice of the devil. He doesn't curve in on himself. Jesus resists temptation because he trusts the word and promises of God rather than trusting the self-serving, the self-centering words of the tempter. Rather than curving in, Jesus stands open-hearted and God-centered. Rather than curving in on himself, Jesus faces the tempter with an awareness of what it means to obey the commandments and love God with all his heart and mind and strength. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, and when God formed us in God's own image from the dust of the earth, God breathed into us the spirit of life. To be human as God created us from the beginning is to trust that this one who created us can be trusted more than we can trust ourselves. <laughs> Jesus shows us what is humanly possible when we trust God and live in this way. He shows us what is possible in making good and right choices. He shows us that it is possible to discern between voices of death and voices of life. Jesus shows us that we were created not to be curved in on ourselves, but to be curved outward in relationship with God and with neighbor and with the goodness of creation. Jesus went to the cross fully human in his suffering and death. And his posture on the cross is the opposite of being curved in on ourselves. On the cross, his arms are open for others. The posture on the cross is for us and for our salvation. This cross-shaped posture is not grasping for power as the devil proposed, but an emptying or letting go for the sake of others. This cross-shaped posture is not avoiding the hunger and pain of being human, but meeting us there. This cross-shaped posture is not holding our sinful, fallen humanity against us, but pouring out life and love in order to save us from the power of sin and death. This cross-shaped embrace is God's answer to a sinful, fallen, curved in on itself humanity. Because Jesus, the beloved Son of God, lived fully human among us as one of us, and because he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, we are no longer condemned as Adam and Eve were condemned for eating of the tree in God's garden. In Christ, we are saved by God's love poured out on the cross. And in Christ, 
the cross becomes a tree of life and our source of hope. Through Jesus, there is a new and different ending to the ancient story of temptation and disobedience and death. Rebellion in the shadow of that tree in the first garden does not have the final word. The devil and all his empty promises do not have the final word. The wounds and scars and brokenheartedness we bear from sin do not have the final word. Death does not have the final word. Through Jesus, we learn how to live and to die in hope. Through Jesus, we have the promise of a restored communion with the very God we turn away from when we curve in our, ourselves in sin. Through Jesus, we are reconciled with the very one who created us from dust. Through Jesus, we are shown a way home into the eternal garden of God's love. Jesus speaks some powerful words at the end of the gospel today. Away with you, Satan, he says. With Jesus, we have the power to name and banish voices of evil and temptation. Following Jesus doesn't mean we'll always get it right, but Jesus gives us that cross-shaped, open-hearted posture for moving through the world. And if we listen to Jesus, if we join in relationship with him, we'll know grace as the answer to our disobedience and fear. We'll know forgiveness instead of bondage to sin. We'll know freedom to serve others rather than being curved in on ourselves. In faith and trust, Jesus' story becomes our story. The way of the cross becomes the way of life, and a tree really does save us, and daily. Amen.
rise as you are able. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, for our community, and for a world in need. Responding, merciful God, receive our prayer. Holy and merciful God, by the cross and resurrection, your beloved Son has overcome the power of sin and opened to us the way of abundant and everlasting life. Help us to live as your beloved sons and daughters, forgiven and freed in Christ. Breathe your spirit into us anew, that by being a community centered in the cross, we would bear witness to your love and compassion. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Creating God, in the beginning you formed the earth and sea and sky and all living creatures, and you called what you made good. Help us to live in creation as you intended us to live, as caretakers and stewards. Bless all those whose work makes it possible for us to have food and shelter and clothing. And help us to remember with generous hearts those who long for a safe refuge and a meal to eat. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Sovereign God, send your spirit of wisdom to guide and sustain those who govern, those who legislate, and those who exercise judicial authority. Soften and transform hearts hardened by the will to power and glory. Call forth leaders filled with a spirit of humility and service. Give them strength to pursue what is just and right. As we mark the one year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we pray for peace in those lands and in the world. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. In times of trouble, trouble trauma or illness, surround your people with your steadfast love. Pour out your mercy on those we know standing in the need of prayer today. All those on our prayer list, and Judy, Ed, Donna, Betty, and others we name aloud and in our hearts. We pray for all facing unemployment or job insecurity or financial instability. We pray for the relief and recovery efforts in Turkey and Syria. And we pray for all those impacted by violence, especially those impacted by the mass shootings in our land. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Bless the ministries of hospitality and compassion here at Zion and the Ministry of Education offered through our preschool. Strengthen and uphold all those whose daily life involves tending to the needs of others, especially those caring for loved ones, dealing with disease, or facing the prospect of death. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. We lift these and all the prayers of our hearts to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also Let with us you. share a word of peace with one another. Peace be with you.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious creator, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You, ha you have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We praise you for Christ, our redeemer, who took on human flesh, lived among us full of grace and truth and died on a tree that we might have life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit on this holy food and on all the baptized. Wash away our sin and cleanse our hearts that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God that we may taste and know the goodness of our Lord. You are welcome to the communion table, communing as we always do by continuous progression, beginning with the choir.
Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life, and we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, shower you with mercy and grant you the gifts of faith and hope. And Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.